Hi everybody, I'm Dr. Richard Stevenson. I'm the director of Stevenson Dental Solutions in San Dimas, California, and I'm a professor emeritus of clinical dentistry from UCLA. And today we're going to be covering the class 2 DO on tooth number 4 on the Columbia Typodont, probably the most difficult class 2 we have. I'm putting a little marker here to show you the extent of the contact, and that's really the reason why this is such a difficult prep. So when you push this tooth into position, you'll notice that it's very tight. And I think that the tightness in this particular tooth causes the uh, prep to be very wide. Look at the contact, how tall it is, occlusal gingivally, and that's really one of the hardest things. Is you really need to drop your box pretty far gingivally in order to break contact adequately. Sometimes it's a good idea to draw the outline form while you're practicing to get an idea where your extensions are going to be, how wide your isthmus will be, where you're going to stop your dovetail, in this case midway between the height of the marginal ridge and the uh, mesial pit. Look how wide the box will be relative to the isthmus too. So they're going to be uh, quite a difference in size from the proximal to the occlusal and that needs to be done in a very smooth manner. So let's go ahead and get started. We're going to utilize the 330 burr as we always do. And I like to make sure that I'm holding the handpiece on the right orientation, buccal lingually, mesial distally, before I start the preparation. And one, one thing you can do is look at it from the facial like this, or you know, looking in the mouth, and make sure that you're not tipping the burr lingually or facially. This happens a lot. So perpendicular to the occlusal table is really the, uh, the go-to position. And then lock your finger rest and the handpiece will do the right thing. You can see that the punch cut is made 1.5 millimeters in an area that does not get too close to your proposed outline form. And then we're just going to move the burr mesially like this at the uh, same depth, 1.5. And then at this point, you're ready to extend into the dovetail area and create that little lock. This is the RGS1, and we can determine that we have at least 1.5 millimeters, which is the requirement for class 2 amalgam preparations. Composites, of course, can be a little more shallow. So let's get started on the uh, dovetail. And you notice how we're tipping the burr slightly to the mesial. And the reason for that is to create a slight divergency to that mesial wall and that will help to support the marginal ridge and resist fracture. If we held the burr perfectly upright, we might create an undermining of that marginal ridge. So there's the dovetail look. Probably a little more than half of the width of the burr more facially, and I typically don't go lingually. I don't think it's necessary. We can get plenty of lock by just going off towards the facial. And of course, move the burr as far as you can comfortably to get to that distal area, but don't break through and hit the adjacent tooth. And at this point, let's switch over to the 245 carbide and just make a little slit, moving the burr down or gingively as we're trying to break the gingival contact. That's our goal right now. Um, how far do we go with the burr? Well, quite a ways. You know, that's the length of the burr, which is three millimeters, and we're going to have to get at least that far, a little bit farther, in order to break the contact. And it's kind of nice to hold the burr like that along the side of the tooth to get an idea of just how far you have to go. You can see that there's uh, a small break down there at the uh, internal. Let's look really close here at this. I'm going to kind of zoom in. And you can see that we've broken contact down there at the gingival. So that's the indication to use the hatchet and break that away. Uh, I like to refer to this as the Sturdivant chip, where you just rock the hatchet, mesial distally, and you knock off that little piece. And then we're going to sharpen up the uh, walls in, in the sense that we're going to create them at a 90 degree exit angle utilizing the instrument by just in a chopping down motion. Even though we don't have adequate clearance, I like to always maintain the proper exit angle. So here you can see that the 0.5 millimeter clearance objective, or let's say at least 0.3 millimeter objective is not made. We're going to need to extend way out here beyond the blue. So we have work to do. 
And this is always one of the most frustrating parts of this preparation is that you have to just keep going, right? So we're going to utilize the 245 burr, chopping down, if you will, from the top and working our way down to create a little kind of a concave crescent shape here on that lingual wall. And what that's going to do is create a little area of undermined enamel, that little beak out there towards the uh, contact area. Now, if that beak is a little bit too thick, you can always go back in with the burr and make it a little bit wider mesial distally so that the beak is easier to remove. So, once again, always maintaining the correct exit angle, 90 degrees, while you chop, is a terrific uh, thing to incorporate into your um, approach so that you're not creating a flare or an extremely undermined area that you have to deal with later on. Let's always keep this in mind because if you have the right exit angle while you're extending and you get the right amount of clearance, you don't have to correct anything. You're going to be where you want to be. So we're moving along. I mean, this is getting there. I think that if this were a composite preparation, you'd probably be nearly completed. Uh, but for amalgam, we need to have a, a more clearance. Uh, we need to be able to get access to uh, condensing the amalgam at those areas. So uh, just the, the nature of, the, uh, of this particular preparation. So once again, this undermine and chip technique. It's kind of a meticulous and tedious, nerve-wracking thing, but you just have to kind of work your way through it and get to the point where uh, you've got the right amount of clearance. Now, I could swear this tooth is moving orthodontically distally. You know, I get clearance and then I go back and look at it and I have less clearance. And it's just because it's such a tight contact. Could you adjust the tooth at a time and make it less of a, less, less of a tight contact? Sure, but what if you don't have that option? What if this is just the way it is in the type of that you're given during a test or something like that? So um, it's a good, good thing to practice on. I think that if you can manage the DO on tooth number four, which is much more difficult than the DO on tooth number 13, uh, you can do just about anything. So we just continue on with this widening buckle lingually, this undermining and chipping technique in order to get the extensions that we're looking for. Gosh, you really have to use a very sharp enamel hatchet. Uh, I would recommend you start with a new one and then learn how to sharpen them. I do have a short video on sharpening these uh, that may be helpful. Remember the exit angle is 90 degrees. Don't hold the instrument like this and make a flare. And if your instrument is scraping up against that molar, that means your axial is not deep enough axially, right? Your axial wall needs to be pushed in closer towards the pulp area. Gosh, we're getting really close, but we're just not there yet. We maybe have 0.2 millimeters of clearance on that lingual side, maybe 0.1 on the facials. So we need to go back in and, and make some more modifications to get the right amount of clearance. So this process continues until you get to the point where you have this amount of clearance. And now you can move on to the uh, smoothing of the outline form. In other words, the refinement of the S-curve. I like to use the 330 RGS, which is a little longer than the 330 and has a very flat bottom to it. So it, it, it's very stable and it doesn't create a ditch. It makes the line angles rounded but very distinct. It, it is a burr that I developed for over two years with Brassler, and I think it's just, it's such a winner. It makes the preparations really uh, stand out. Now the burr is not really good for prepping a tooth from the beginning. It's more of a refining burr because it's not very efficient on its end, which makes it really kind of safe to use. It, it almost is a non-end cutting burr, so it won't inadvertently deepen your pulpal. It will just refine your line angles and refine your walls. And um, I think it just uh, works really well. 
I'm going to go ahead and speed up the video and get through this part because I do want to show you uh, another technique for doing smoothing with this same burr and that is to utilize slow speed but a lot of you probably are wondering how can you put a friction grip burr into a slow speed handpiece well that requires a special push button friction grip attachment so here's my slow speed motor and there's a friction grip attachment and we can just this is your e-type connection so it actually can work with the electric hand pieces as well uh, and um, you can see it's push button so and it holds all your friction grip burrs so it's pretty sweet and then we can come in here and just create some smoothing with the slow speed now I think it's time to turn our attention to uh, refining the internal line angle here with a hatchet uh, we can use the hatchet in this downward motion and uh, then we can slide the, the hatchet back over towards that wall to complete the line angle. And uh, that is a really nice thing to do for a class 2 amalgam. Really these should be uh, super sharp and defined uh, and in some schools you're going to even need to put in a retention groove. In this particular prep today, I did place retention grooves by virtue of making really sharp internal line angles. Once again, you really have to utilize a very sharp instrument. After you finish doing that, let's go to the gingival margin trimmer and create the gingival bevel. Now this is about a 15 or 20 degree downward slope just to make sure that the enamel rods are not undermined and it should be the entire thickness of the enamel. So it's, it's not a very small bevel, it's a pretty wide bevel. And so start in the middle and just rotate the instrument. After you've rotated it, then you can just slide it across. Never start on the buckle side and slide all the way to the lingual. Start in the middle and work your way over. So right here, let's do the axial popal bevel as well. So we're going to start by putting the instrument right here in the middle and then rotating it to get the bevel started. Turn the instrument around and perform the same maneuver here going the other direction. You know, it's really surprisingly easy to create this axial pulpal bevel with a nice sharp tinge of a margin trimmer by rotating it from the center over towards the lingual and then sliding it across, flipping it around and doing the same thing here moving it out towards the facial. So I think at this point the preparation is uh, pretty much completed. Uh, let's take a look at the the width of the remaining marginal ridge is about 1.6. If we look at the depth of uh, the pulpal it's 1.5 at least and we should have a flat pulpal wall convergent there and divergent over there and uh, the axial pulpal bevel is present, sharp line angles, and then even like little miniature retention groove there, we have a gingival bevel as well. The clearance on this tooth is just about 0.3 millimeters. Uh, I tend to be a little bit less than uh, the RGS one. Uh, you can see the depth is, is, is good, good retention. It looks like it was uh, performed in a satisfactory manner, you've got a one millimeter wide isthmus measured with the RGS-3. And what we're looking at here on the distal is the axial depth is less than 1.5. This is the RGS-4, but it's more than the RGS-3. So it's between 1.2 and 1.4. And that's really a nice depth that you could have for type it on tooth. It looks like all of the measurements here uh, look pretty good on this really challenging class two. Uh, hang in there, be patient. Uh, you can do it if you're diligent. And a few photos here of the final prep again. You know, the motto of Stevenson Dental Solutions is seeking mastery. And in Latin, that is quaremos magisterium. I think that's kind of cool. So moving forward, if I mention that we all want to be Quarimos Magisterium. I'm simply saying that we want to be excellent. Hope everybody had uh, fun watching this video. Take care.